Uh, in the second part of this talk, I'll review causes of ischemic stroke in children. Overall, uh, the incidence of stroke in children is uh, relatively low. It occurs in between 2 and 13 uh, per 100,000 children per year. Nevertheless, um, it is one of the top 10 causes of morbidity and mortality in children and um, often leads to uh, disability, which is why it's an important disorder to recognize. Um, about 45% um, of strokes in children are hemorrhagic, and uh, the remainder, about 55%, are ischemic. In this part of the talk, I'll be speaking mostly about ischemic stroke, and then in the third part, mostly about hemorrhagic stroke. Um, among ischemic strokes in children, um, the, the, uh, the predominant cause is arteriopathy, so disorders of the um, cervical and intracranial arteries. Um, a smaller proportion of strokes in children are cardioembolic, and then um, about 15 to 20% um, have uh, other causes or no identifiable. Uh, most common arteriopathies in children are uh, acquired. So the um, uh, major cause of arteriopathy is um, dissection of the craniocervical vessels, um, sometimes spontaneously and sometimes as a result of trauma. Another very important cause of arteriopathy in children is inflammatory. Um, so uh, this includes um, both infectious and uh, non-infectious inflammatory disorders such as rheumatologic disease, including um, lupus, Takayasu, arteritis, polyarteritis, nodosa, and so forth. Um, I will talk a little bit more uh, today about a unique disorder often seen in children uh, called focal cerebral arteriopathy, which is classically associated with varicella infection, but may occur after a number of other infections as well. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, sickle cell disease is highly prevalent, and, um, and it is associated with arteriopathy and stroke. Um, unlike in adults, uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease is a very rare cause of stroke in children. There are certain uh, genetic disorders of accelerated atherosclerosis, um, but as a proportion of um, ischemic stroke in childhood, um, this is uh, almost vanishingly rare. A subset of arteriopathies in children are genetic and have to do with dysfunction of the various components of the arterial wall, which is the smooth muscle or the collagen matrix. These are also relatively rare. Um, when stroke is suspected in children, um, based on the presence of a focal neurologic deficit or sometimes a focal seizure with a non-resolving neurologic deficit, um, the first line evaluation may be um, by either a computed tomography or magnetic resonance imaging. CT is useful for rapid evaluation in unstable patients, and it's more widely available than magnetic resonance imaging. Um, however, it's not very sensitive for acute ischemia. There are, there are certain subtle signs of acute ischemia on uh, computed tomography, but can sometimes be quite hard to see. However, usually a hypodensity is present within 24 to 48 hours in children who've had um, an uh, ischemic stroke. Mag magnetic resonance imaging is much more sensitive in the acute period, especially diffusion-weighted imaging, um, which can detect acute ischemia um, within hours and perhaps Um, when it's available, um, because of the very high presence of um, uh, arteriopathy, the very high incidence of arteriopathy in children with stroke, angiography should be performed. And that can be performed using CT, MR, or conventional catheter angiography. Um, and what we're looking for in that case are uh, vascular abnormalities, um, some of which I'll describe in the, in the uh, section to follow. Uh, but um, because about... Um, at least about 65 to 70 percent of arterial ischemic stroke in children is caused by, um, by an arteriopathy, it's very important to examine the blood vessels. Uh, laboratory studies are often useful as adjuncts, so we would uh, collect a complete blood count, coagulation studies to look for a hypercoagulable state, um, toxicology screens, blood cultures, um, and inflammatory markers because of the high prevalence of infection in children with uh, arterial ischemic stroke. And um, sometimes it's useful to run a thrombophilia panel, especially when no other definite cause can be identified. Uh, an echocardiogram is also indicated to look for cardioembolic causes, so an intracardiac shunt or um, a lesion um, within the heart that predisposes to thrombosis. Uh, 
Um, again, um, the first line management is with neuroprotection, um, avoidance of fevers, avoidance of abnormalities in blood glucose, and um, normal tension. Um, in some cases, it may actually be useful uh, to allow children with stroke to be slightly hypoten hypertensive to, um, to ensure that uh, territories at risk of further ischemia are well perfused. Um, so what we want to do mainly is to avoid hypotension. Uh, thrombolytics are sometimes used in children. Um, they are not, um, they are not uh, approved in most countries for pediatric use, uh, but uh, there are several pediatric stroke centers who do use thrombolysis in adolescents according to adult guidelines. Um, in some cases where it's available, endovascular intervention may also be used. Um, we consider this uh, up to six to 12 hours uh, for anterior circulation inclusion and up to two days for basilar. Uh, the mainstay of therapy is antithrombotics. Um, so short-term anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy is often initiated when children present with stroke until the cause is determined. And the long-term therapy uh, depends on the underlying cause. So in some cases, anticoagulation may be necessary. In some cases, antiplatelet therapy. Um, in other cases, um, the definitive therapy may be another form of treatment. I'll talk briefly about dissection. Uh, dissection may occur in either the carotid or the vertebral arteries, or sometimes in the intracranial arteries. It accounts for about 7.5% of stroke in children. Uh, a major risk factor for dissection is trauma, but non-traumatic dissections can also occur, um, especially in children with connective tissue and collagen disorders, um, in the setting of pharyngeal infections. And those with uh, extreme arterial tortuosity and uh, migraine is also um, a risk factor that is uh, associated with a, a higher prevalence of uh, dissection in the cervical systolic arteries. Uh, typically, dissection is managed with antithrombotics um, for a limited period, um, usually three to six months. There is no real evidence to say whether uh, anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin or warfarin is uh, better or worse than aspirin, um, and often this depends on the preference of the treating physician. We do, however, try to avoid anticoagulation and dissection that extends into the intracranial arteries um, because of the worry of, um, of a possible subarachnoid hemorrhage um, in, uh, when uh, extension affects um, uh, vessels that are uh, within the dura. This is an example of an eight-year-old child who had um, recurrent uh, stroke in the posterior circulation. On the flare image, um, you can make out um, hyperintensity um, in the cerebellum, which corresponds to a chronic ischemic infarct. And um, angiography in this child uh, demonstrated that he had um, irregularity in the V3 segment of the, um, of the right vertebral artery. So you can see that um, for most of the course of the vertebral artery, the artery is smooth. Um, and then once you enter the V3 segment, it becomes quite irregular. What was interesting about this case and um, other similar cases is that, um, that uh, the dissection um, it, uh, is, um, the, the severity of the dissection or the flow limitation from the dissection depends on the position of the head. So when the child turns his head to the right, this dissection, which is um, in neutral position, just an irregularity, becomes a flow limiting um, stenosis. Um, this is sometimes called bow hunter syndrome after the, um, the posture adopted by bow hunters with the head turned to one side. And um, oftentimes in this case, um, what, you, uh, what, what we suspect is that there's chronic dissection that may be initially provoked by tra trauma or, uh, or may be spontaneous, and it's um, exacerbated or prevented from healing by bony or ligamentous abnormalities. Um, in these cases, um, uh, Treatment with uh, antithrombotics often fails, so the children may present with recurrent strokes despite antithrombotic treatment, um, and we would then proceed to surgical decompression of the artery. Uh, another important cause of uh, arteriopathy in children is uh, moya moya. Um, moya moya is a term that refers to chronic progressive stenosis of the terminal in internal carotid arteries. When we speak of moya moya, we typically divide it into two categories. So moya moya disease, which is an idiopathic disorder 
uh, meaning um, that we don't know precisely what causes it, but um, we do think that there is some contribution of genetics. Um, and part of the reason for that is that um, it occurs with uh, different frequency in different populations. So it's much more frequent, for example, in Japan than it is in the United States. And in the United States, it's more frequent um, in children of Asian ancestry than in uh, children of European ancestry. So it's thought that there's probably some genetic contribution. Um, in contrast, we also speak of Moya Moya syndrome, which is, has the same clinical picture, um, but is associated with certain um, well-defined syndromes. So for example, cranial radiation um, can cause a Moya Moya-like syndrome. Um, Moya Moya is also seen in Down syndrome, sickle cell disease, and in uh, type one neurofibromatosis. Patients with Moya Moya often present with stroke or transient ischemic sy symptoms, um, which can be provoked by hyperventilation, coughing, straining, or illness. So the classic story of a child with Moya Moya is that they might be playing or crying, um, and they develop uh, transient symptoms of weakness um, of one side of the body, or uh, loss of speech, or sometimes transient dysphonia um, that may resolve when the child calms down. Um, when you hear this story, um, it's uh, highly suspicious for Moya Moya, and the diagnosis um, can be confirmed by angiography. Um, what you see is a puff of smoke appearance of the vessels around the circle of Willis. This is an example of an eight-year-old boy with Down syndrome, which is uh, uh, highly associated with Moya Moya, who presented with episodes of posturing of one side of the body um, when he was playing or uh, excited. And what you can see here is that um, there's uh, obliteration of the terminal uh, carotid artery um, and the, the, its major branches. And, and um, these vessels are replaced by this exuberant uh, sort of collaterals, which have a, uh, the appearance of sort of a puff of smoke. Um, Moe is the Japanese term for puff of smoke. So, um, so you often see this very uh, prolific collateralization um, both from the vessels around the base of the circle of Willis and from uh, the extracranial circulation. Um, um, these collaterals provide a rel relatively tenuous blood supply to the cortex, which is a uh, reason for um, transient ischemic symptoms, especially with hypo hypoventilation or hypertension, hypotension, um, or um, settings of increased metabolic demand, such as illness. And oftentimes in these children, you'll see evidence of periventricular watershed white matter disease or chronic ischemic infarction. The mainstay of treatment is the avoidance of dehydration and low blood pressure. In fact, uh, children with Moya Moya are often spontaneously a bit hypertensive. And it's important to recognize that and not to treat it because they may de be dependent on the slightly higher blood pressure for cerebral perfusion. Um, Antiplatelet therapy is often useful to maintain blood flow through the small collaterals and to prevent them from uh, thrombosing. So we often use aspirin, three to five milligrams per kilogram per day. And then um, in children who have recurrent symptoms, um, despite medical management, uh, we often proceed to surgical revascularization. There are a number of techniques that can be used. Um, they can be divided uh, generally into direct and indirect revascularization. So in direct procedures, the surgeon directly anastomoses a, a branch of the um, external uh, carotid artery, usually the superficial temporal artery to the middle cerebral artery. And there are a number of indirect procedures which involve um, onlay of the uh, superficial temporal artery or another artery from the extracranial circulation onto the meninges, the dura or the pia. And this promotes, um, over time, uh, angiogenesis and um, regrowth of blood vessels into the uh, parts of the um, cortex that are uh, uh, prone to ischemia. Um, so Moya Moya is, is typically a bilateral disease um, that progresses um, without treatment. Um, in contrast, there's another entity in children that um, is sometimes mistaken for Moya Moya, or sometimes mistaken, um, on the other hand, for uh, vasculitis which um, has been termed in recent years focal cerebral arteriopathy. This is a unilateral stenosis of the terminal intracranial carotid artery and its proximal branches, not bilateral like Moya Moya. It often presents with stroke, sometimes recurrent stroke, um, but again, in contrast with Moya Moya, it's usually monophasic. So 
um, the stenosis develops. Children are symptomatic for a period, and then uh, and then it usually doesn't progress any further. So the the um, arteriopathy burns out. Um, there's often residual stenosis of the vessels, but it doesn't get worse. Historically, this disease is associated with uh, varicella zoster virus infection. Um, these days, um, uh, since we have a varicella zoster virus vaccine, it's it's uh, less often seen um, with that. Um, with that type of infection in countries where the vaccine is, um, is utilized. However, there's growing recognition that it can also be precipitated by other infections, including other herpes viruses, such as herpes simplex. This is an example of a 14-year-old boy um, with focal cerebral arter arteriopathy who presented with a new onset uh, right hemiparesis. Um, on the left, you can see a CT angiogram, um, which uh, demonstrates uh, the patency of the terminal carotid and middle cerebral artery on the right side of the brain. But on the left side, um, there's uh, abrupt um, tapering and occlusion of the, the uh, proximal portion of the middle cerebral artery. Uh, a CT was obtained at the time of presentation. And there are subtle signs of ischemia um, on, this, um, on this CT uh, axial image. So, Particularly if you pay attention to the region of the basal ganglia. On the right, you can see the sort of the normal signal characteristics of the basal ganglia, which is um, slightly uh, hyper intense um, compared to the surrounding white matter. Uh, on the left side, which is affected by ischemia, you can see uh, a loss of this hyper intensity. So um, there's a hypo intensity and a loss of differentiation between the basal ganglia structures and the white matter. And there's also some effacement of the lateral ventricle, which um, is caused by uh, edema due to stroke in this region. The, um, the ischemic lesion is much better appreciated on MRI, which confirms that um, there is uh, ischemic infarction in the territory of the basal ganglia and, um, and uh, the insular operculum. Typically, this is treated with antiplatelet therapy. Um, it's not known what the most effective treatment uh, is. Because of the association with uh, infection, uh, acyclovir is sometimes used, um, but we don't know if it's efficacious. Um, and because of the presumption that this is an inflammatory disorder, we often use steroids, uh, but again, um, there's no evidence that this is efficacious. Um, nevertheless, there are several cases that I've seen personally and many of my colleagues have seen that have improved dramatically with uh, steroid therapy. And there are plans for uh, at least two uh, international studies looking at the efficacy of steroids in this disorder. Um, so those were um, a few important causes of uh, arteriopathy in children that I, wanted to, um, that I wanted to discuss briefly. We'll also discuss um, some other important causes of stroke, um, such as cardioembolism. As I mentioned earlier, cardioembolism is a, is a relatively rare cause of stroke compared to arteriopathy in children. Um, but it does, um, it is important to think of, um, especially in children with uh, known structural heart disease or valvular heart disease due to endocarditis um, or history of rheumatic fever. Um, structural heart disease with right to left shunt um, is especially um, uh, problematic from the stroke perspective. So, uh, arterial or ventricular septal defects, um, patent foramen ovale, and extra cardiac shunts such as pulmonary arteriovenous fistulae. Um, in certain children with hematologic risk factors, um, there is uh, also a risk of stroke, um, especially in the presence of a shunt such as a patent foramen ovale, so those with polycythemia, anemia, or uh, other disorders of coagulation. Um, congestive heart failure is a risk factor for formation of uh, ventricular thrombus and stroke. And of course, in children with cardiac surgery, there's a risk of um, post-surgical thrombosis and uh, arrhythmias, which can predispose to thrombosis down the line. This is a, an example of a 17-year-old girl who presented with headache and very mild sensory symptoms. Um, an MRI confirmed the presence of at least two discrete emboli. Within the, um, within the right parietal lobe. Um, she underwent echocardiography and was found to have a widely patent, payment, uh, widely patent foramen ovale. This is a very common uh, finding. Patent foramen ovale is, is not that uncommon. 
um, but um, when um, it's found in the association in association with stroke, it can be highly suspicious for a cardioembolic source. Um, in, in this case, um, an evaluation for um, an underlying um, hypercoagulable state or predisposition to venous thrombosis is warranted. And what we found in this uh, child was the presence of what is called May Turner anatomy. So it's compression of the uh, iliac vein by the iliac artery. And when, when such compression is present, it can predispose to stasis and thrombosis, which um, then uh, travels through the um, through the inferior vena cava um, into the right side of the heart, through the patent foramen ovale to the left side, and, uh, and from there to the brain. Uh, this is another example of a child who has a history of recent cardiac surgery. So in this case, um, there is a known uh, cardiac structural risk factor. Um, these scans were obtained about a month after his surgery, and what you can see is that there's evidence for um, uh, rather widespread damage. So um, on the CT, you can um, faintly make out areas of hypodensity which correspond to stroke, and they appear to have different ages. So there's areas of rather uh, discreetly well-defined hypodensity in the occipital lobe, and um, slightly less discreet, less defined hypodensities in other parts of the on the uh, magnetic resonance flare imaging, you can see um, that, um, again, these are uh, much better defined. So there's, um, there's evidence of um, uh, flare signal hyperintensity um, in several um, vascular territories um, in both hemispheres, which is highly suspicious for a cardioembolic source. And there are also areas that are, have uh, progressed to encephalomalacia, which suggests much older injuries. Interest, interestingly, uh, if you look on the T2 star susceptibility weighted imaging, besides these larger lesions, you can see innumerable uh, punctate lesions, which correspond to areas of uh, micro hemorrhage um, that uh, presumably uh, were caused by a very small emboli that uh, traveled to the brain um, either during or shortly after cardiac surgery. As I mentioned earlier, um, in some parts of the world, sickle cell disease is a very important cause of stroke in children, um, and it does raise the risk of stroke substantially. Um, so sickle cell uh, disease um, puts you at a risk of about um, of both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Um, the, the rate of ischemic stroke is higher. It occurs in about 25 per 10,000 um, cases of sickle cell disease per year, and the rate of hemorrhagic disease is uh, somewhat lower. It occurs in about 5 per 100,000 per year. The, the age distributions are also a bit different. So rates of ischemic stroke peak at around two to nine years of age, especially um, two to five years of age. And the rates of hemorrhage uh, peak at around 20 to 29 years of age. Overall, the stroke risk in um, children with sickle cell disease is quite, is quite high. Uh, up to 11% of children um, have stroke by the age of the presentation uh, can be quite variable. Um, so children with sickle cell disease can have large vessel infarction, small vessel infarction, as well as watershed infarctions. And they can also be at risk of uh, progressing to a Moya Moya syndrome, as I had mentioned earlier. So because of chronic damage to the vascular endothelium of the uh, internal carotid arteries, um, there uh, ends up being progressive stenosis and development of um, Moya Moya collaterals. Children with uh, sickle cell disease also um, very often develop asymptomatic white, vessel, white matter disease, which uh, presumably is due to chronic occlusion of uh, small cerebral vessels. Acutely, when a child with sickle cell disease uh, presents with stroke, the, the, um, the essentials of management are hydration and correction of hy hypoxemia. Um, we also recommend exchange transfusion to hemoglobin S of less than 30%. To, uh, to you know, prevent further vascular occlusion from sickle cells. Um, over the long run, um, one of the most successful ways to prevent stroke in, in children with sickle cell disease is, um, is periodic transfusion to maintain uh, hemoglobin S less than 30%. And um, we select candidates for chronic transfusion based on transcranial uh, Doppler ultrasound which typically has begun around two years of age. Um, we interrogate the, uh, the vessels of the anterior circulation, the, um, the anterior and middle cerebral arteries, and if the velocities are very elevated, 
uh, meaning 200 centimeters per second or higher, the child is at very high risk of stroke and um, periodic transfusion protocol may be, uh, may be initiated. Um, if Moya Moya does develop, revascularization uh, may be indicated both to, to augment cerebral perfusion and to prevent later hemorrhage from rupture of uh, fragile Moya Moya collaterals. Thank you for your attention.